Uh, thank you. I think there's a lot of geo geography students in here. Is that right? Is geography classes? If you're in a geography class today, where's your hand? Oh, wow, that's great. You know, I'm a geography major and an engineer, and actually the reason I got in the Peace Corps was getting a degree in geography first from UC Santa Barbara, and then later on I got a degree in engineering from CSUN. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about my experience in the Peace Corps, and, and this goes back to the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about the two countries that I served in. The first one was a country called Chad. You've all heard of Libya, right? Libya's in the news. If you look at a map of Africa, directly south of Libya is Chad. And you never hear about Chad because not much goes on there, but there were Peace Corps volunteers there. Chad is a landlocked country in Central Africa. It's due south of Libya, and it's due west of the Sudan. If you've heard of Darfur and the, and the refugee problem with Darfur, a lot of the refugees fled into, into Chad. The population today in Chad is about 10 million people. When I went to Chad in 1978, it was only 4 million. It's a former colony of France and it gained its independence in 1960. French and Arabic are the official languages in Chad. It's one of the poorest countries on earth, usually in the bottom five or 10 countries. Over 75% of the people in Chad are subsistence farmers and herders, meaning they don't really have any occupation except to gather food and grow food with their own labor. Chad has three geographic regions. The northern third, roughly, of Chad is in the Sahara Desert. It's very dry. The middle third is in a, in a region that stretches across Africa called the Sahel. And that's kind of a transition between the desert and the savanna, which is in the south of Chad. In the 1970s, the Sahel was undergoing a drought. The, the rains that usually come seasonally were not coming as often and the people that lived in the Sahel were suffering because of lack of rainfall. So a lot of um, uh, government agencies and non-government agencies, organizations, started to put uh, projects into the Sahel to try to increase the water supply to the people there. And that's what the project that I went into in Chad was, was to drill water wells in the Sahel. Uh, this is the scene of one of our wells being driven uh, when I was a volunteer. Uh, sorry for the quality of this. this I, I had uh, an old roll of black and white film I took to uh, when I went in the Peace Corps and I lost the negative. So the, the pictures that were made back in the 70s by my parents, the only ones I have. So I uh, put these on, I uh, had these copied for this presentation. Uh, you can see here, and I have some other pictures. Uh, this pointer is not real strong, but this is a hydraulic drilling rig mounted on the back of a truck. It uses a diesel engine to power the hydraulics, and it's called a, um, let's see, it's called a table rotary drilling method. Um, when I went to Chad, I had no drilling experience at all. I had no water well experience at all, but I was sent there to train Chadians to drill water wells, so that kind of tells you a little bit about the Peace Corps in a way, in a bad way. Um, but anyway, most of the wells in Chad before this time were shallow and hand dug. Uh, the water table is not very deep in Chad, and you could dig 20 or 30 feet and, and find water. The problem with shallow wells is they dry up easily, and they get contaminated very easily. They're open, uh, th stuff gets thrown in, animals get into them, and the water ends up being contaminated and not safe to drink. This is a, another view of a different drilling rig. Um, and it's a side view, and you can get an idea here. You can see in the back uh, part of the truck is the, hydro is the diesel engine. This is the drilling rig, and back here is the apparatus that turns what we call augers. And augers are just like giant, giant drill bits that drill through soil. Uh, most of the Sahel part of Chad, the soil is, is sandy and loamy. It's not really rocky. There's no bedrock until you get really, really far down. So we could drill water wells in Chad. Usually, uh, you get 150 to 200 feet down, and you could find very wet soil, very wet, sandy soil. And that's where we'd put our, uh, the bottom of our wells. Another view of the same rig, a little bit closer to the back. Uh, this is the part that spins here. It's, it's swung out so we can do different, act, different activities. We had a cable system here that we could use when we needed it. Um, most of the wells, as I said, usually 150 to 200 feet deep. 
And the, the uh, augers, you had to clip them together with like cotter pins, and they were each one meter long. And the way we drill a well, uh, first of all, we drive into a village and we'd say, would you like a well? And the people went crazy. They, of course, they would want a well. Because normally, gathering water in Africa is very labor intensive. The water supply is not good. And people love to have a well in their village. So they would tell us where to put the well, and it didn't really matter because the ground was very, very uniform. And we'd set up the rig, and we'd lay out all these uh, pieces of uh, auger, one meter long each. We start drilling. Usually it took um, half a day or so to drill down and find a nice wet layer. And by the number of augers we had down in the hole, we could tell how deep it was to the water layer. And then we'd start preparing our, our well pipe. And the well pipe was usually a two and a half inch galvanized steel pipe. And we had to thread it there on the site, and we had to have couplings to screw it together, but we'd figure out how deep this well is and how much pipe we needed to drop into it. At the very bottom of the well, there's something called a well screen, which is a stainless steel slotted screen, usually about a half a meter long or so, that you screw on the bottom of the well, and that's what goes into the water layer. At, on the top of that screen, you put a foot valve that allowed water to come up above it but not go back down, and then you'd have leathers that lifted the water up uh, in the well. So that's the basic process. Now, this is what a finished well looks like. And you can see how happy the people are also. This is, this is the payoff to doing this kind of work. Uh, this is all handmade stuff here. This is the actual uh, well pipe here and you can see the rod coming out of the top of the pipe. And this is just the thing that you push up and down to, to, to lift the water. Each stroke on the well would usually uh, bring up maybe several quarts of water. And we made these uh, parts in the shop before we would go out on the trips out into the field to um, construct the wells. We would also put, as you, you can kind of see down here, a little apron. What, you, what we're trying to do there is create what we call a sanitary seal. And this isn't a very big seal if you know the water business, but uh, what you want to do is have the water you've pumped out of the well not go back down to where your bottom of your well is. Otherwise, you get contamination from the surface down to your, to your water. So we built these little aprons out of uh, bricks and concrete and so that the water would go down. And we often, we, whenever we could, we'd, we'd put the well a little bit on a side slope instead of a flat spot so that the water would also drain away from the well. Um, when we were, one thing that you do when you drill a well is something called development of the well. And when you, put your, when you first put your screen down 150 feet or 200 feet underground, it's surrounded by a lot of fine materials, a lot of fine sediments. And what you want to do is get all of those out so that the, what's left is just the rock and the, and the larger sand particles. And those act like a giant filter around the tip of your well. So usually we develop the well with the, with the cable on the, on the drilling rig for about a day in order to get the water real clear. And then uh, we'd put the finished product on top. When we were developing the well, and pumping all this water out with the machinery, people would line up with their buckets and their pails and collect the water because it was being pumped for them. So that was one of the things that we did. We also filled the barrels on our truck. We'd go out in the field for two or three weeks at a time with enough material to put in five or 10 wells. And we'd fill up our barrels with drinking water that we pumped out of the ground ourselves. And it was not treated, it was just, it was just naturally filtered from the ground. There was no chlorine or anything added to it. Uh, this is one of the um, locations we, we were uh, staying when we drilled a well. This is a grass and reed hut that the village uh, lent to us so that we could have a place to store our, our, our supplies during the day. And uh, outside, that's me right there, there uh, a long time ago. This is a, uh, we had cots with mosquito netting. Uh, and it was hot at the time that, that I was there in Chad. So we'd usually sleep outdoors if we could with mosquito netting. We would keep our, our food in here and supplies in here. And some villages we would stay just a few days and drill one well. Some villages were bigger. We might stay uh, and drill two or three wells. This was one of the compounds that, that volunteers lived in. This is one of the uh, pickup trucks that we had, part of the project. 
Uh, there was a house here that uh, volunteers lived in, and just outside the picture on the left is another house. I think there were two bedroom houses. Uh, this particular location in southern Chad, where I lived, the house on the left that you can't see, the front of it was actually, it was a building that had two parts. The back part was, in a, was a two bedroom house, and the front part was a bar. So that was kind of handy. We didn't have to go that far uh, when we were off work. We also took um, our cook. We had a cook that we employed where we lived, and when we'd go out in the, into the, uh, we'd call it growing on Bruce, into the field to drill wells, we'd take the cook with us, and we'd take uh, rice and coffee and things like that, and the cook would cook our meals for us when we were out uh, during wells, drilling wells. This is an outdoor market in Chad. Um, it's a typical place you could go to buy whatever was available from the local countryside, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, sometimes meat, uh, spices, things like that. And our cook, we'd give money to our cook and he would go to the market and uh, find what was available and cook us a meal. Chad is, um, I mentioned it's Arabic and French speaking. Uh, most of Northern Chad is also Muslim and a lot of Southern Chad is Christian or animist. Uh, different places in Chad have weekly or monthly markets where people come from miles around and bring their goods to sell. And these are some uh, people coming to the market in one of the, one of the towns that we were drilling wells in. And this is the same town, this different shot of a camel coming, coming into town carrying uh, goods that um, someone was going to sell. Get a little bit of an idea here, you see two kinds of uh, architecture. This is a French era colonial building and it, it sort of has a crenellated uh, top to it, uh, almost like a fort, and over here is just a mud building. And the mud is very common building material in uh, Africa. Let's see, if you could, oh, turn. If you wanna hit those for me. Um, yeah, just go forward one. I did manage to get some uh, Kodachrome film. If you guys heard of Kodachrome, that's no longer available. But anyway, Kodachrome, I have hundreds and hundreds of slides that I took in the Peace Corps. And this is another drilling rig, a different uh, arrangement in uh, Chad that we used. And here you can actually see we're pumping water out of the well and into barrels to use for uh, our water supply. The program in Chad was actually a function of the, of the Chadian government. Uh, the money for the program came from the United States and from, and from France. They, the foreign aid was given to the Chad to, to spend on this program. Go ahead. This is the, um, we call it the magasin. This is the yard, kind of like the construction yard that we uh, ran our well drilling program out of in southern Chad. We actually had two locations, southern uh, country, um, city in southern Chad, and then the capital had an, the other program. So there were two teams. Usually there was uh, one Chadian, one paid Chadian employee for every uh, volunteer. And I, as I said, the idea was that the Americans would train the Chadians how to, how to drill wells and how to take care of wells. And we actually, uh, part of the job was not just drilling wells, but going around to existing wells and changing the leathers so that the, the well could still pump. And on the truck door here, you can see the um, acronym for the, for the program, the Chadian government. Um, uh, program that did the wells. This is a, just a typical street scene in, in Chad. Um, unpaved streets, walls, and tree lined. The French um, like to have wide boulevards, obviously, and so they, they copied their, what they have in, in a lot of cities in France in their colonies in Africa. And this is just another street scene in Chad. Uh, not very many people out and about uh, when I took this, there is one woman off here on the right, and this is absolutely the typical way that you carry things in Africa, is you put it in a bowl and you put it on a woman's head, and that's how you move things, other than, other than using bicycles, I should say. Bicycles are also very common for transportation. Okay, now I'm going to switch and talk about another country and a whole other different kind of project. This is uh, going to be Malawi, and Malawi is a uh, country in southern Africa, so southeastern Africa. And what happened to me in, in Chad is uh, a civil war broke out 
in uh, February of 1979, and the Peace Corps decided they didn't want us to get killed, so they evacuated us. And uh, I spent a month in Cameroon waiting to find another country to go to, and they offered me the opportunity to go to Malawi and uh, be a volunteer in Malawi. So instead of coming home, I just went from Chad to Cameroon to, to Malawi. And in Malawi, I was attached to the uh, Ministry of Health, and uh, our projects uh, in that ministry the volunteers worked on were primarily public health and sanitation related. And uh, these are three of my co-workers in Malawi. These are, uh, I think they were called health assistants. And they probably had a grade school education, and then they had gotten further education in uh, the, the uh, principles of public health, nutrition, sanitation, and so forth. Uh, this is a group of us. Uh, one of the main activities we took part in were called under five clinics. And what an under five clinic is, you go out to villages about once a month, and you have all the mothers bring their babies, and you weigh them, and you give them uh, a lecture in, in public health, and you give them vaccinations, and if need be, if, if you have it, you give them uh, nutritional supplements like dried milk. And uh, this thing right here is a scale. And what every mother had was a little fold-out chart, and they could chart their baby's growth. And every month, you put the weight of the baby, and if the baby was growing um, in a healthy way, the chart, the weight of the baby fell into a band, a green band. Most of the babies fell below the green band. They didn't gain weight as, as fast as they should. But this is a typical uh, setup for, for us. Here you can see the little blue um, four-wheel drive thing we used some of the time. And this is a typical turnout at one of these under five clinics uh, in the bush in uh, Malawi. Another scene, uh, the mothers are, I give a lot of credit to the mothers. Most, most um, people in Africa, especially rural people, have never been to school, they have no education but they hear about these programs that the government's putting on and they hear about that their babies could be more healthy. And what we, what we did at these clinics, besides weighing each baby, is we interviewed the mothers, especially when a mother came with a new baby. We'd, we'd ask how many children she had. And most mothers would tell us seven children, four alive, meaning three had died. So 20, 30, 40% uh, infant mortality was extremely common in Africa. So we were interviewing them to find out uh, how big their families were, how many children they had dead, and how many alive. Uh, so these mothers are waiting um, for their babies to be weighed or to get dried milk. Another scene. Uh, go ahead. Now, this is the business end of, of what the babies, the children, would get for, for as far as vaccinations. And the vaccinations in in Malawi were for diphtheria, whooping cough, and tetanus primarily. Um, we also, I think, had measles, uh, a measles campaign. This baby, I don't know if you can tell, uh, you see the belly of this child, greatly distended, the arms and legs are, are small, the hair is thin and light brown. This baby is not well. This baby is, is badly malnourished. Uh, so that's what, um, what some of them looked like, and some of them were worse than this, but this, this was not a, a very healthy child. This is the dried uh, whole milk that we, we would distribute to um, mothers. Uh, I don't know if you can see in the back, but this bag says furnished by the United States of America, not to be sold, or I can't read that, but. The idea was this was donated, it was not to be, no one was supposed to make money off this, it was to go straight to the people who needed it. And we would, we would measure out a whole milk, uh, mostly to mothers that had underweight children. Now we, we didn't follow this milk home and see what happened to it. We think that some of this milk ended up in the tea in the afternoon of the adults. But we did see progress on the charts of the babies that, that mothers that got the milk, so we, we were, um, happy to be able to do this for, for uh, people. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures I took of kids over there. Uh, this, I think, is a healthier child than the one before. Um, it certainly looks 
more alert and, and happier and, and fat in the face and so forth, not just the belly, but, but, but generally uh, more well fed. This is just a countryside scene in Malawi, uh, driving along a road. I happen to live in, in a part of Malawi that was close to some uh, mountains. So a lot of the places I went were, were higher in elevation and cooler uh, than, than other parts of Malawi. This is a uh, maize, they call it. Um, it's uh, what we would use for cattle, actually. They, they take the kind of corn that we raise for cattle and they pound it into a, into a powder or a flour and then they make a porridge out of it. And that's their staple. This looks like a pretty good sized cornfield or maize field. This is all hand, hand agriculture, hand done. No machinery, no animals, no nothing. This is all people with hoes. That's what you call subsistence farming. It's when you're doing it just for your own subsistence. If they had a good uh, rainfall at the right time, if they had maybe were able to afford fertilizer, they might actually have a surplus, in which case they would sell it and use, it to, use the money to buy things they needed that they couldn't uh, trade for or make themselves. Um, and at times, when Malawi had a smaller population, it was an exporting country. They actually exported grain to, to surrounding African countries. And, uh, but lately, the population has, uh, uh, I think, tripled roughly, and so it is not as, not as able to export food anymore, and it's not even able to, make, to grow enough food for itself. A neighboring country to Malawi, not far away, um, is a country called Zimbabwe, which you may have heard of. In fact, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and, and Malawi at one time were, were a confederation under the British. It was um, Nyasaland, Southern Rhodesia, and Northern Rhodesia. Zimbabwe used to be the breadbasket of Southern Africa until uh, Robert Mugabe ran the country into the ground. And now it's, uh, it can't do that. Anyway, I just wanted to show you what it looks like, uh, a, a maize field. And Malawi is also uh, geolo geologically very interesting because it is in the southern part of what's called the Great Rift Valley of Africa, the Red Sea. Uh, there's rifts in Tanzania and Kenya, and the southern end of the rift is actually in Malawi. So we have all these uh, granitic extruded rock formations that are very beautiful. Actually, they're intrusive that have been exposed, I believe. But it's a beautiful country. Ge uh, Geologi geologically and geographically speaking. This slide uh, shows small fish being sun-dried. Malawi has the 12th largest freshwater lake in the world, mostly within its borders, uh, Lake Malawi. And it's a very uh, good lake for fishing. There's a lot of fish there, and a lot of the fish that they catch, they dry, and then they can be shipped. Rather than eating fresh fish, you dry the fish, and then you can ship it for days or weeks, and then you can eat it after you've boiled it, maybe with a little uh, onion or, or tomato or something. You can boil it and then serve it with the porridge. So this is um, dried fish here. I did happen to come across some well drilling in Malawi also. It wasn't part of the project I was in, but I did take some pictures of, uh, of a drilling rig. This particular uh, type of drilling. It wasn't rotary table drilling, it was actually cable tool, I believe, where you drop a heavy tool down in a hole over and over and over and over and drill a hole that way. And uh, go ahead. So this, this uh, they're both actually holding on to the cable that drops the tool down the hole. And what they have to do every so often is once they have a whole bunch of ground up rock at the bottom of the hole, they have to pull the tool out and then, and then drop in a scoop, more or less, and scoop out the, the, the um, pulverized rock. That they, and they dump water down here. It drills better when you, when you pour water down. So go ahead. I believe this is the cable tool itself that, that um, this is either, I don't remember, it's been a while now, but this is either the, the tool that that digs the hole or it's the, the scoop, and I believe it's the digging tool. And this, this is the thing that scoops out the pulverized rock, and you can see there, there's a bunch of wet pulverized rock here that's been spread out on the ground. And then this is one of the um, uh, wells, the, the pump on the, on the top of the well. And it's the same principle, it's just a different design. It's a, a crankshaft here that moves the rod up and down and lifts the water up to the surface. And Malawi uh, 
it's much harder to drill. You could not have drawn, done the same drilling method in Malawi because the ground there is much rockier. In Chad, you could almost, we drilled, um, I think only once did we ever drill a hole that didn't end up being a well. So we had a, about a 99% success ratio. In Malawi, there's much more rock and it's much harder to drill well, so it's a little more time consuming. Uh, this uh, is a picture of, of me when I arrived in, in Malawi, or soon after I arrived. Uh, this is actually the hospital in the district that I was sent to. And this district was in southwestern Malawi. Uh, a district there is about equivalent to a county in California, about the same size and roughly the same population. Uh, for most of the time I was there, I was the only non-Malawian that lived in, the, in this district. And it just so happens I took a picture two years later when I finished, and this is about the last picture that it was taken of me in, in the place where I lived uh, before I left. Uh, it was called Mwanza, and it was a beautiful place um, to live. I had um, great experience. Mwanza is known for um, tangerines. In, in all of Malawi, there's only one place that has the right climate for tangerines, and that was Mwanza. Uh, I, it's called a hospital. It's called a district hospital, actually. Um, this hospital had no doctors. The entire district I lived in had no doctors. Uh, the hospital did not have electricity. It did have a generator that they could fire up for certain things. It did have refrigeration that was, that was run by kerosene. You can use ref, uh, kerosene to run a, a refrigeration cycle. So they kept their drugs cold with kerosene-powered refrigerators. Um, it was quite primitive. There were nurses there, and there were uh, people called medical assistants that had some medical training, but there were no doctors. So uh, you didn't want to get sick there if you could help it, obviously, but Malawians had no choice. So they would come to the hospital every day, and they'd stand in long lines to be seen by someone. And Malawians had this idea that unless they got a medicine or an injection, that they hadn't actually gotten treated that whatever they were, was wrong with them, they had to have either an injection or, or a medicine or they weren't getting treated right. Um, the, the Peace Corps told us, but by the way, most of Southern Africa and, and Western, uh, Central Africa is uh, malaria. There's malaria there all the time. That's why we slept with mosquito nets. But the Peace Corps told us, the doctors and the nurses in the Peace Corps said, if you get sick, and we took malarial suppressant medicine every week. They said, if you get sick, just take more of the medicine. Don't let them treat you. And, and I followed that advice, because I got sick once, and I didn't know if it was malaria or not, because you have to have a blood test to find out what, what's, what's wrong with you. And the needles in Africa are used over and over and over and over and over. And maybe they're sterilized, maybe they're not, but they're not sharp and they're used multiple times, so I never allowed myself to get injected except by the Peace Corps nurse using an a unused uh, needle. It so happens I left Malawi, uh, this picture was taken in, um, I, let's see, it was taken in March 81, so that's 30 years ago this month. Um, it so happens that not too long after I left, HIV and AIDS began to spread throughout Southern Africa. And most of the volunteers now in Southern Africa, especially in Malawi, are there because of HIV and AIDS. And the, 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 that disease has is, is killed millions and millions of Af Africans as well as people elsewhere. But that's the primary uh, job of um, Peace Corps volunteers in Malawi now is dealing with that. When I was in Malawi, besides the, the clinics, um, we also worked on sanitation. I don't know how much time I have, but let me talk just briefly about sanitation. In Malawi or in Africa, sanitation is a pit latrine. It's not running water, it's not hot water, it's not soap. It's a pit latrine where you, where you go to the bathroom rather than on the ground. And when you go to the bathroom on the ground, pretty soon that ends up in your water supply. Uh, much faster than any other way. So cholera is one of the worst diseases in, in southern Africa. You've probably heard of cholera recently because of Haiti and the, and the earthquake, and then they had cholera coming after it. Cholera is a uh, fecal oral route disease, and if you get, if you, if one of us got cholera in this room, we wouldn't die, 
we'd go to the doctor, we'd get rehydrated, we'd take medicines, and we'd be fine within a few days. In Africa, people die, especially children. They get dehydrated within a matter of hours or days, and they die. So cholera was one of the main reasons that people in Africa had pit latrines, because people would come out from the government and say, the only way you're going you're to survive is if you dig a pit latrine. So there'd be a cholera epidemic, people would dig pit latrines, and they'd use them, and then five or ten years later, the latrines would be full, and that was the last pit latrine, because there was no more cholera. So why dig another pit latrine? So our job was to find out who had latrines, and reward them, and then encourage people to dig, to dig pit latrines and, and use them. So it's, it's an uphill battle. I believe this World Water Day has been going on since 1993. So I think this is the 19th World Water Day. They had d uh, decades in Africa to try to establish clean water for people. Um, they have a long way to go.